All right, so we will uh, now talk about <clears throat> the example on slide eight. Which, us, which gives us some information about a spring mass simple harmonic oscillator. And it wants us to find the equation of motion uh, of the object. Okay, so let's write down the information that we are given about the spring mass oscillator. So basically let's also draw. So the drawing is not super important here. So we have a spring, a spring mass system. And um, okay, so the K of the spring is given. And um, okay, we are also given the mass. Let me just write these down. So the M is equal to 0.1 kgs. K is equal to 0.4 newtons per meter. And the amplitude of the simple harmonic motion is six meters. Okay, and then we are given some information about the, um, what the system was doing at t equals zero. All right, now what is the equation of motion gonna look like? So as we've seen, uh, the equation of motion is like this, x as a function of time. Basically what the equation of motion does is that it's a function, it gives us x as a function of time. It tells us what the x is, or what the position of the simple harmonic oscillator is at any um, given instant of time. So x of t is equal to a cosine omega t plus phi. So this is what the equation of motion looks like generically. And our job now is to figure out the values of these three constants, a, omega, and phi. So we need to figure out a, omega, and phi. These are the three things that we need to figure out. All right, so how do we figure out a? So obviously a, there's nothing to figure out, we already know, so let's just plug that in. A six, so x is six cosine, omega t plus phi. All right. Okay, um, let's see if we can somehow figure out what the omega is. Can you think of a way of figuring out what the omega is? You could um, pause the video now and see if you can figure it out. Um, the way to do it, of course, is omega, use the fact that omega square is equal to k divided by m. That's where the omega came from. Uh, if you uh, look in the la previous lecture. So we can immediately find what the omega is. So omega square would be uh, 0.4 divided by 0.1, which is four. So omega is equal to two in this case. So we found another, another of these constants, six cosine two t plus phi. Now we just need to figure out the value of phi and we are all set. So how do we figure out phi? Let's try to use some of the information that uh, we're given here. We are told that at t equals zero, x is equal to three. So let's see if we can get that, uh, get something out of that. So x is equal to three at t equals zero. So let's plug those in. Three uh, is equal to six cosine, uh, two times t is zero, six cosine phi, right? So, that tells us that cosine phi is equal to one half. And so what is uh, the value of phi? So the value of phi is cosine inverse. Okay, the value of phi is cosine inverse, oops, one half. And what is cosine inverse one half? So, that is, that is uh, 60 degrees, right? So phi is going to be pi over three. All right, now, is that, is that all? Uh, is that the only possible value of phi? You know that that's not the only possible value of phi uh, because uh, cosine of uh, minus pi over three, Cosine of, okay, so please excuse uh, Tori. Uh, so cosine of minus pi over three would also give you one half, right? So um, another possible value of phi is minus pi over three. So the two possible values of phi are minus pi over three plus 
pi over three. So these are the two possible values of phi. So now the question is, how do I figure out which value of pi to, to use here? Uh, which would go into the equation of motion? Because it seems like from here, both of these uh, would be allowed. For that, we need to use the last piece of information which we haven't used yet, which is the uh, velocity at t equals zero. So let's write down an expression for the velocity. You know how to get, get an expression for the velocity. You just uh, take the derivative of position. So v is equal to dx dt. So that's going to be uh, minus 12 sine 2t plus phi, right? And that's going to be um, minus 12. Okay, so that, that's our uh, v of t. So now all we have to do is just plug in t equals zero. So we are told that at t equals zero, v is six root three. So let me just, so six root three is equal to uh, minus 12 sine phi. Okay, so, um, so from here we find that sine phi is equal to minus root three divided by two. So what value of, so we need, a, we are looking for a phi whose sine is negative root three divided by two and his, whose cosine is uh, one half, positive one half. So as you can see, um, the value of phi has to be negative phi over three. That would meet both the requirements. Sine of pi over three would be minus uh, root three divided by two, and cosine of pi over three would also be, uh, would be one half, which is exactly what we need. So the final equation of motion, we can just put all the pieces together and write down the final equation of motion. Sorry. Uh, that would be x as a function of time is equal to six cosine, 2t minus pi over 3, minus pi over 3. And this is the equation of motion of the simple harmonic oscillator, this particular simple harmonic oscillator. Now, there is one thing that I wanted to point out here. If you look at the PowerPoint, so if you look at the PowerPoint over here, you can see uh, when we discussed the phase angle, I told you that the phase angle phi is determined by both the initial displacement and the initial velocity. Uh, I mean, which means both the displacement and the velocity at t equals zero uh, determine the value of phi. And that is exactly what we saw in the example that we just did. So to determine phi, we needed both uh, the, the value of x, the position of the simple harmonic oscillator, the mass, and the, the velocity, of x, uh, velocity of the mass uh, at t equals zero in order to determine the value of phi. Right? All right, so the next thing that we're gonna talk about is, um, so there's this very nice example, uh, which is fully worked out in the textbook. The reason that I have it all worked out on the slide is because a long time ago we had a different textbook and I loved the example from this, this particular example from this textbook, so I put it on the slide. But you can see how much enormous amount of work this is making this slide, so that's why I don't have the heart to get rid of it. So please review this example. It, will, it goes over all the concepts that we've covered so far. Um, you can either review it from the textbook or from this slide. It might be a good, a good idea to work out part of it over here. So I'll let you do the first uh, slide, uh, first couple of parts yourself. And we are just gonna talk about this part. So what we have in this problem, and yeah, so I'll just pull up the slide on a different computer, okay. So what we have in this problem is a simple harmonic oscillator, a spring mass system. And uh, we are given, in the previous example, we have uh, figured out the mass of the simple harmonic oscillator equals 0.5 kgs. 
and we are given the K, which is 200 newtons per meter. So that's the mass, uh, 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 that, that's the mass and uh, the, the spring constant of the spring. Okay, we are also told that at T equals zero, uh, the displacement was um, 0 0.015. I'll just call that x initial, and that's 0 0.015. And we are told that the velocity at t equals zero, let's just call that v initial, that's also given. It's point plus 0.4 meters per second. We need a plus or a minus. This is one dimensional motion, so we need to specify what direction the motion is. So a plus or a minus is necessary to give us the direction in which the, uh, the mass is moving. So we need to find out um the equation of motion and we also need to find the values of the constants so let me just so essentially we are doing the same thing so x is a cosine omega t plus phi we need to figure out what the value of a is and what the value of um, omega is and phi is actually omega we already know omega is no problem uh, you can easily find omega. Omega is equal to square root of k divided by m. So that's a known quantity. Um, it, on the slide, I have the value written down. It's 20 radians per second. All right, so we know what omega is. We need to figure out a and phi. So how would we do that? So you would do that in exactly the same way we did the last example. So you would plug in um, t equals 0. And that gives us, I'll just work in symbols so it's easy to see what, what's going on. So x0 would be equal to a cosine phi and v0. So we need an expression for v. So let's just find that first. v would be dx dt. So that's minus a omega sine omega t plus phi. Okay. So now let's plug in t equals zero and set v equals v zero. So v zero is equal to minus a omega sine phi. So from these two equations, let's call this one and let's call this two. From these two equations, we have to solve for the two unknowns, a and phi. So how do we do that? Uh, x zero, v zero, omega are known. We have to solve for a and phi. All right. So what we can do here is uh, a common trick that you can use when you have um, a sine phi and a cosine phi is to use the fact that sine square plus cosine square is always equal to one, right? So let's do that. Uh, so sine phi is equal to v zero divided by minus v zero divided by a omega. Cosine phi is equal to uh, x zero divided by a. So if I plug these into the fact that sine square plus cosine square is equal to one, then I get an equation from which I can solve for a. So, um, uh, so v zero square divided by a square omega square plus x zero squared divided by a squared is equal to one. And so a is going to be square root of x zero squared plus v zero squared divided by omega squared. And I have that on the slide. Um, it's not always obvious to students where that comes from, but now you can see that in order to get this, we didn't do anything um, different than what we did in the last slide. Okay, how would you find phi? So for that also, you can use a trick that we've often used uh, many times in the course. So we have our equation one right here. And we have our equation two right here. Can you, can you look at these two equations and see if you can uh, remember the trick that we used to find phi? What we have always done is we've divided uh, the one, the equation that has the sine in it by the equation that has the cosine in it. So we want to divide equation two by equation one. And so what does that give us? Um, 
So if you divide uh, equation two by equation one, uh, you get V zero divided by X zero. Write it over here. V zero divided by X zero is equal to um, minus a omega sine phi divided by a cosine phi, right? The a cancels out. And so you get tan phi So you get tan phi is equal to uh, minus V zero divided by X omega X zero. And so phi is equal to tan inverse of this quantity minus V zero divided by omega X zero. And then you can just plug in numbers to get the numerical value of the angle, uh, angle phi. So that's how you do this. And once you have the, so once you figured out what the A is uh, and what the phi is, you can plug them into uh, this equation for the equation of motion. And you already know what omega is and you get the full equation of motion of this particular simple harmonic oscillator. All right. So hopefully it's clear to you that uh, a simple harmonic oscillator uh, is de described uh, the, the spring mass simple harmonic oscillator is described by this differential equation. D2x dt squared plus omega squared times x is equal to zero, where omega in this case is equal to k divided by m and square root of k divided by m. And it's a constant that tells you how fast the, the harmonic, the, the system is oscillating. If omega is large, that means it's oscillating very fast. If omega is small, it's oscillating slowly. And um, just one second. And omega is related to, this is a review of what we did in the last, uh, last chapter. Omega is related to the frequency as frequency is equal to omega divided by two pi. Okay, I have to keep an eye on Tori here. Uh, frequency is equal to omega divided by two pi. And omega is also therefore related to the time period. And the time period is one over the frequency, which is two pi divided by omega. So omega is a constant, which just tells you how rapidly the system is oscillating. Okay. Um, now, So this is the differential equation of a simple harmonic oscillator. And we saw that the solution to this differential equation is this, can be written as this equation, A cosine omega t plus phi. And uh, we just saw, so all simple harmonic oscillators uh, are given by this generic, have an equation of motion, which is this generic equation. And the particular values of A, omega, and phi are what separate the different simple harmonic oscillators from one another. All right, okay. So that concludes our discussion of the spring mass system. Now we're going to look at uh, a couple of other similar uh, simple harmonic oscillators. Uh, an almost immediate extension of what we've learned is the vertical simple harmonic oscillator. So what is a vertical simple harmonic uh, oscillator or vertical simple harmonic motion. So previously we had a spring mass system set up like this. We had the spring and the mass was sitting on a horizontal surface. So if you just leave this mass to be, where would, uh, where would it be? So it would, the spring would be at its uh, equilibrium position. So the mass would be at X equals zero. Uh, we always call the equilibrium position of the end of the spring as x equals zero. So that's where the mass would be, right? Okay, vertical simple harmonic motion is when you hang the spring from uh, a horizontal surface. So 
and then you put a mass uh, at the bottom of the spring. So the whole thing is hanging vertically. So in this case, would the mass be at the equilibrium position of the spring or would it be at a different position? Think about that. So is this the equilibrium position of the spring? The answer is no. Why? Because if you were to just have the spring, then the equilibrium position of the spring would be somewhere over here. Right? So this would be why uh, I, I should call this the equilibrium position of the spring. So that is when there is no mass attached to the spring. And we are assuming that the spring itself is very light. It doesn't have any significant mass. So if you don't have a mass attached to the spring, then the spring would be, uh, the end of the spring would be over here. When you attach a mass to the spring, the spring will um, stretch a little bit. So it will stretch from here to here. Right? And you can easily figure out how much the spring is going to stretch if you know the value of k of the spring. Because if you consider the equilibrium of this mass, there are two forces acting on it. One force is the force due to the spring. What is the magnitude of that force? The magnitude of that force is going to be k times x, um, k times, uh, let's call this delta y or something. And then there would be the weight of this mass acting down mg. So from these, you can easily figure out what the delta y is going to be because mg would be equal to uh, k delta y. So you know what the delta y is going to be. So you know how much the spring uh, will stretch uh, in order to keep this, uh, in order when this mass is attached to it, right? And it's in equilibrium. All right. Now, suppose you displace the mass a little bit. So you could displace it in many ways. You could just pull it down a little bit, or you could just give it a whack, or you can do both. You can pull it down and give it a whack. Uh, any of these things, you disturb the system. So what's going to happen is it's going to start oscillating up and down, and you're going to have a simple harmonic motion again. Right? I'm going to skip the details, the mathematical details of this simple harmonic motion. But once again, you can prove that the um, net force is going to be proportional to the amount that the mass has been displaced. So that means you are going to have, um, it, that means it's going, the restoring force is, is proportional to the displacement again. And that's something that I'm stating without proof, though it's very easy to prove that. And uh, once again, you're going to have simple harmonic motion. And the angular frequency of simple harmonic motion turns out to be exactly the same as in uh, the horizontal simple harmonic motion that we'd seen earlier. So it's still going to be k divided by m. So this part, I'm just stating the result without actually proving it. But if you're interested in, in seeing how that comes about, you can just look at your textbook. It's a very simple two or three lines of algebra to prove that. So this is vertical simple harmonic motion. The main difference between horizontal and vertical simple harmonic motion, other than the fact that one is horizontal and the other is vertical, is that for vertical, uh, the equilibrium, uh, the um, equilibrium position of the mass is not uh, the unstretched length of the spring because the spring has to stretch a little bit for the mass to be uh, in equilibrium. Whereas for horizontal simple harmonic motion, the mass is at the equilibrium position of the spring. So hopefully that is clear. I have a simple plug and chug example on slide 35 that you can just look at. It just uses the fact that omega is equal to square root of k divided by m. So that is our very brief discussion of vertical simple harmonic motion. And once again, if you are interested in the details, you can just look at the textbook. The next thing that we're going to look at is angular simple harmonic motion. Oops. All right, so a typical example of that would be a, a spring, um, uh, a wheel with a coil spring. So I have a picture of that on the PowerPoint. So, and, and we actually have one of these uh, in uh, the demo room uh, at Vanderbilt. So I could have actually brought this out and showed this to you. Um, so, so what this is, is you've got uh, a spring and the spring is in the form of a coil. 
And then if you turn the uh, wheel, then the spring will try to come back uh, to the way it was, right? So, so if, you, if you try to turn the wheel, the balance wheel, then the spring will just try to bring it back. But then the wheel will overshoot and go in the opposite direction. And so if you just, if you disturb the system, like if you just turn it one way uh, and let it go, then it's just going to, the balance wheel is just going to uh, rotate back and forth. So this is an example of angular simple harmonic motion. Okay. So for, uh, you can easily analyze the system here. And the analysis is going to be very, very similar to what we did with the spring mass system. So if you turn the uh, wheel by an angle theta, you can show from experiments uh, that the torque is going to be proportional to the angle theta. And it's going to be obviously in the opposite direction. So for example, if you decide to turn the, this, the wheel uh, in the, in the uh, counterclockwise direction, like over here, then the torque will obviously be in the clockwise direction because the, the spring doesn't like being twisted that way. So it'll try to come back to how it was. So that's why the torque and theta should have a relative negative sign because uh, they are in opposite direction to one another. And another thing, as I said, uh, that you can find from experiments is that the torque is directly proportional. The magnitude of the torque is directly proportional to theta. So that means if you double the angle theta, you will feel double the torque, right? Uh, so that, that is something that is true for most springs like this. And that's something that you can easily do an experiment to verify. So putting these two facts together, the first fact, fact is that the torque is proportional to the angular displacement theta. Uh, theta just means how much you have turned the wheel. And the second fact is that the torque is in the opposite direction to theta. You can put both of these together and write this equation. Torque is equal to negative some constant times theta. So um, the constant K uh, has a fancy name, which is the name is not important at all. I'll just write it over here. So um, for, so the, uh, for the balance uh, spring system, um, spring with balance wheel is what I mean. Uh, for the spring with balance wheel system, what we found is the torque that you feel when you turn the balance wheel is equal to negative some constant times theta. And this constant is called the torsion constant. That's a mouthful, but you don't have to worry about the name. It's just the constant of proportionality between the torque and theta, right? So now let's apply Newton's second law. So you know from chapter 10 that the torque is the net torque equals I alpha. So I times alpha, alpha as you know is d2 theta dt squared is equal to minus k times theta, right? So do you see that this equation is looking very, very similar to the equation that we got um, when we applied Newton's second law to the spring mass system? So the equation that we had gotten over there to remind you was um, m d2x dt squared is equal to minus some constant times x. Do you see that these two equations are identical, except that the variables have different names? So instead of an x, you've got a theta. Instead of an m, you've got an i, and instead, and, and you have a k. So you can see that they're exactly the same mathematical equation, right? So you can apply exactly the same mathematical analysis. Uh, just remember that our variable is theta instead of x now. So you, you get d2 theta dt squared is equal to minus k divided by i theta. What did we do with the constant? We replaced it by omega square, right? So we can do the same thing over here. So, and that will give us d2 theta dt square plus omega square theta is equal to zero, where omega square is defined as three equal, three lines like this means defined as k divided by i. All right. 
So this is exactly the same differential equation that we had for x. So we know what its solution is. We can write the solution. So theta is equal to, um, so the solution to this differential equation, just to remind you, was x is equal to a cosine omega t plus phi. That's what we had, right? So we can do exactly the same thing. Theta is equal to some theta max. Uh, in the PowerPoint, I, I have capital theta, which you can use if you like, or you can call it theta max. It doesn't matter. It's just a constant times cosine omega t plus phi is exactly the same equation that we had when we were doing the linear case, right? So that tells you that theta here is, the, is going to oscillate back and forth uh, sinusoidally. Um, and and everything, is, uh, everything is identical or analogous to what we did for this, the, the spring mass system. Uh, omega is the frequency at which it's going to oscillate, angular frequency of oscillation. And omega depends on the torsion constant k, and it also depends on the moment of inertia, right? Notice that there's a similarity between the omega that we have here and the omega that we had in the, uh, in the spring mass case. There, omega squared was equal to k divided by m. So omega squared depend on, depended on, uh, omega depended on the stiffness of the spring, k, and on uh, the measure of inertia of the mass, m. And here also you have the same thing. Omega depends on um, the stiffness of this uh, spring, uh, uh, of this coiled spring, and, uh, which is k, and the rotational inertia of, uh, of the mass, uh, which is i, right? Okay, the rotational inertia of the, uh, of the mass, which is i. And so that's it. Okay, now let's look at one specific example of, um, angular simple harmonic motion, and that is the physical pendulum. So this is a very important, a special case of angular simple harmonic motion, the physical pendulum. Okay, so what is a physical pendulum? You're all familiar with the simple pendulum. We've talked about the simple pendulum many times. The simple pendulum is just consists of a massless string of length L and a point mass. So you're making the system as simple as possible. You're making the string completely massless and you're making the point mass have no spatial extent. In reality, if you actually build a pendulum, the string will not be massless. The string will have some mass and the bob, which is the mass that you've attached at the bottom, even if you make it small, it will have some spatial extent. So the simple pendulum that we've been working with so far is an idealization, and that's why it's called the simple pendulum. A much more realistic situation is a physical pendulum where you don't make these assumptions. So a physical pendulum is any mass. It doesn't have to have any particular shape. Let's say that the mass, this, this, uh, this mass has a center of mass over here. The, so the mass is also not distributed uniformly in this. The center of mass happens to be over here, right? If you were to uh, allow this to pivot around any point you want, so suppose you pin this to the wall and uh, with, a, with a thumb tack or something, and so now it can pivot around this point. So let me just make a different color here. Now it can pivot around this point, right? So uh, this is the pivot point. Which means this, this object can rotate around an axis passing through this point. So that's what the pivot point is. And this is the center of mass. I'll just write it here so it's... All right, so now suppose you swing this to one side, right? Then, suppose you swing this to one side, then it's just going to oscillate back and forth, right? And it will be a pendulum. So this pendulum is called a physical pendulum. So here you've not made any uh, as simplifying assumptions about what the pendulum is like. So, um, so this is an example of a physical pendulum. So anything that's pivoting uh, uh, around a certain point, ah, sorry, physical pendulum.
So anything that's pivoting around a certain point is a physical pendulum. So if you were to uh, hang from some pull-up bars and then swing back and forth, uh, you would be a physical pendulum. Right? All right, okay. Now, let us calculate the um, frequency of a physical pendulum. So let's say that, uh, let's, let me just draw another physical pendulum here. So let's say that I have a certain mass, irregular shaped object, and let's say that it pivots around this point, right? And its center of mass is located over here. So I'll make the pivot point red. Pivots around this point, and its center of mass is located over here. All right. Let's call this distance as L. So please note the meaning of L very carefully. So the meaning of L is L is defined as the distance from the pivot point to the center of mass of the uh, physical pendulum. I should probably say center of mass of the system. That is the definition of L, right? Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna, if, if you let this swing, if you just let this go, what is the period or frequency at which it's going to oscillate? So, so uh, if you were to swing it to one side and let it go, it's, it's gonna swing back and forth. So what is the period or frequency uh, at which it's going to uh, oscillate? Or in other words, we wanna find the omega of the simple harmonic oscillator. All right, so how do we do that? Well, we would just apply Newton's second law as usual. So Newton's second law says that, uh, okay, so let's identify all the forces. So there is uh, the weight mg acting down like this. Let's call this angle, the angle that it swung out by as theta, right? So we're gonna apply Newton's second law in angular form, net torque equals I alpha. So mg is exerting a torque about the pivot point, L, right? So what is that torque gonna to be? So you know how to calculate torque. And, and mg is the only force acting on, uh, on, on this mass. So there's only one torque that goes into net torque. So the torque is going to be, the torque due to mg, the formula for torque is Rf sine theta, right? So the F obviously is just mg. R, is going to be um, L and sine theta. So that is the torque, right? Okay, so let's set uh, the torque equals I alpha as we, uh, as we know, uh, the net torque is equal to I alpha is Newton's second law. So uh, tau net, equals I alpha. And alpha I'm writing as d to theta dt squared. And theta is the central angle, right? So, um, so theta is the angular displacement. And so tau net is equal to I alpha. So I just wrote down Newton's second law. And let's just plug in for tau net, uh, the only one torque we have is MGL sine theta. So let's plug that in. So I d to theta dt squared is equal to mg l sine theta. So, and, and there's one other thing that I need to do here. Um, the torque and theta will have opposite signs, right? So if theta, if this mass swings out in the uh, clockwise, in the counterclockwise direction, the torque will be a, a clockwise torque. mg is gonna be a clockwise torque. So if you define the sign convention that counterclockwise is positive, then 
tau should be given a negative sign. If you've chosen the sign convention that clockwise is positive, then theta would be negative, and sine theta would be negative, and torque would be positive. So in other words, there is a negative sign which should be put into this equation in order to account for the directions of things. Just to account for the fact that theta and torque will be in opposite directions. So that goes in over here. So the equation that we are getting, if I just divide both sides by i, is d2 theta dt square is equal to minus mgl over i sine theta. Now it looks like I'm running into a problem here. Look at the equation that we had gotten for theta earlier. d2 theta dt square right here, d2 theta dt squared is equal to some constant times theta, right? In other words, the torque was proportional to theta. It seems that the equation that I'm getting here is d2 theta dt squared is equal to some constant times sine theta rather than theta. So the torque is, so you can see from, from this equation that the torque, which is the left-hand side, is not proportional to theta, it's proportional to sine theta, right? Now, this equation by itself is a rather complicated differential equation, and it does not have uh, simple solutions. However, if we decide that we are only going to restrict ourselves to small values of theta, in other words, we are not swinging the physical pendulum all the way out here, we are just maybe swinging it out a little bit. Uh, so keep the value of theta under 10 degrees or something like that. So just, just small values of theta. Then, we can use something called the small angle approximation. Which says that for, for small values of theta, theta is approximately equal to sine theta, and uh, which is approximately equal to tan theta. Very, very important, theta is in radians here. So the part, so the small angle approximation says that these three quantities, theta, sine theta, and tan theta, are pretty much the same uh, when theta is small. You can check this on your calculator yourself. Um, just switch to radian mode, take some small angle, um, like 0.1 or something like that, and find sine of 0.1, and then find tan of 0.1, and you will see that they're very, very close to one another. The differences are like several places of decimal. Um, so the, these quantities are all very close to each other if theta is small. You might have seen something like this, just a small aside here, you might have seen something like this long time ago in calculus class. So you, when you were talking about limits, um, do you remember this limit? X tends to zero sine X over X. You might remember this, uh, this limit from your high school calculus class, what's the value of this? Its value is one, right? Now, you probably never thought of what this is telling you. What this is telling you is that when the x, the value of x is small, then sine x and x are pretty much the same thing. Their ratio is one. So this is basically just the small angle approximation. All right, so what we're going to do now is apply the small angle approximation. So if theta is small, then we can replace the sine theta by, by just theta. And so then we get the equation, which is which we know how to deal with, d2 theta dt square equals, and I'll just move um, everything to the left-hand side, d2 theta uh, is equal to uh, plus mgl divided by i theta is equal to zero. So I, I use the fact that sine theta is approximately the same as theta when theta is small. And for practical, you can check this on your calculator yourself. Uh, for practical purposes, theta small means like theta is less than 10 degrees or something like that. Um, all right. Now we know how to handle this. So the next thing that we do is we, we just call this constant omega square, d2 theta dt square plus omega square theta is equal to zero. Now it's exactly like what we've done a few times by now. That's our definition of omega square. And that's exactly what we were after. We wanted to know what is the omega? What is the 
frequency at which our physical pendulum is oscillating back and forth, that is given by omega. The angular frequency is given by omega. Omega is equal to square root of mgl divided by i. And if you want to find the actual frequency, like how many, time, how many times is it swinging back and forth per second, um, you would do what you're looking for is the frequency f. f is connected to omega. Uh, f, f is equal to omega um, divided by 2 pi. That's how you can find the physical frequency in hertz. And if you're interested in the time period, time period is just two, uh, 1 over f, so that's 2 pi divided by omega. So if you plug that in, you can just get t is equal to um, 2 pi divided by omega, so i divided by mgl. So this is the equation for the time period of a physical pendulum. And um, there are two very, very important things to keep in mind here. Now, when we are talking about i, remember from chapter 10 or 9, uh, when you talk about the moment of inertia, the moment of inertia depends on which axis you're measuring it about, right? So if, uh, which i are we talking about here? So let, let's look at the diagram. So the i that we are talking about for this object is just one second. The i that we are talking about is the moment of inertia about an axis that's passing through the pivot point, right? So that is the i that you should be using. So the correct i to use here in this equation, i is the moment of inertia of the system about the pivot point. So be very careful when you're calculating an i to plug into this formula. It's the uh, moment of inertia about, uh, about an axis through the pivot point. And another thing to be careful about is L. So what was L again? L is the distance. So I wrote down the L right here. L is the distance from the pivot point to the center of mass of the system. So that is what L stands for. So when you're using this formula for uh, the time period, please make sure that you know which I to use, what is the correct I to use, and what is the definition or the meaning of L. Um, distance from the pivot point to the center of mass of the system.